Good evening. Wisdom Eccentrics by Nat Chang Rumshe, Chapter 42. There are many stories to tell, whimsical, humorous, hilarious, mysterious, poignant, and conventionally inexplicable. Candid Aitchen and I are likely to tell them, interwoven with what we teach. Each story has its time and place and each serves a purpose that arises in the moment. Chapter 42, Entirely Dressed in White. In December 2009, I went to Nepal with my son Robert, Doodle Dorje. He went wearing robes as he wished to begin to make a commitment in terms of Vajrayana Buddhism. Rachel, Kunzang Sodron, was no longer an infant in arms, but too young for the adventure, so Kandudachen remained at home with her. Kandudachen's elderly mother had some health problems, and that made the decision simpler, yet no easier. As always, it was marvellous to see Kunzang Dorje Rinpoche and Jomo Sampel again, but on this occasion he looked much older than before. My mind went back to seeing Chimmy Riggs in Rinpoche for the last time and how he looked at that point, the shining, transparent appearance. I wondered immediately if this would be that last time I was to spend time with Kunzang Dorje Rinpoche. Rinpoche was as happy as ever, especially to see the 13-year-old lad he'd named Duddle Dorje. We had a series of joyful meetings. Barcher was there with us, as were Nordzin and Erdzin and their ordained students. We were a smaller group than usual and this worked out well. Rinpoche gave me advice about the future. He also gave me remarkable artefacts and personal practice items. Although the Lama's accoutrements were wonderful, they came from Rinpoche, and they would have been wonderful whatever they had been. That they'd been his put them beyond price, but they also carried a sense of foreboding. Rinpoche was giving things away, and that seemed to mean something. He gave Doodle Dorje his name officially by writing it on his headed stationery and asking us to photograph each stage of the event. It was clear that he wanted us to have a record of the occasion, and I wondered what it could betoken. I made no inquiry because the situation was too joyful, and I didn't want to detract from the experience for Duddledorje. One lunchtime, Rinpoche showed me a photograph that I'd given him several years earlier, it was a photograph that Johannes Frischknecht had given, sent me from Bhutan. The photograph showed an apparently albino Tibetan wearing an emerald green tuba, and Johannes gave it to me because he thought it might be Aroyeshe. Rinpoche nodded intently and said Aroyeshe. It was a strange moment. I was looking at a previous point in a continuum with my present moment experience at one end and a sea of mystery at the other. In the following summer, Rinpoche's being became increasingly rarefied. His health began to decline in August and it became clear that my last visit had really been my last and I would never see him again. Kyabje Trulshik Rinpoche had performed rites of longevity, but Rinpoche was not thus to be detained. Jomo Sampal Daichen was unable to find our email details amongst Rinpoche's papers, and so I was unable to go to see him at the end. I finally heard through Barcher and Le Ponergian Tenzin that Rinpoche had passed away. I would have gone immediately had I known, but as it was, the moment passed. I shouldn't have gone to Nepal at that time of year anyway, due to my peculiar physical reaction to heat. 
Rinpoche might even have called me Tomyor if I'd attempted it. It wasn't so bad when I was young, but now it causes my blood pressure to rocket. Dr Trugyal advised me strongly not to go to Nepal other than during the winter. So Conrad H and I contented ourselves with sending an emissary, Varcha. Varcha, as ambassador for the Confederate Sanghas of Aro, wrote to us by email every day, telling us every detail of what occurred, and relayed our messages in return to Joma Sampel. I shall quote from his emails rather than reword what he had to say. On Monday, the 6th of September, Jomo Sampel saw Kandros arriving and departing throughout the day and night. Whether my eyes were open or closed, I saw them, she said. They came to Rinpoche's side and touched him. Rinpoche told me that he was happy and enjoyed Ursel. He said that he would soon stop talking, but his mind would remain clear. Rinpoche didn't want to be attended by doctors as he was in full possession of his, of his dying process. Early on the morning of Tuesday the 7th, Rinpoche asked for a small glass of whiskey. He drank it and recited Padmasambhava mantra three times. Moments later, his breathing ceased and he merged with space at the invitation of the Khandros. Rinpoche had rested in meditation for the week prior to his passing and knew exactly what was unfolding. Jomo Sampel said, Rinpoche had a beautiful expression on his face. Reports arrived of rainbows at Sopema and the other places that Rinpoche had lived. On the Saturday morning of the 11th of September, Rinpoche's kudung was placed inside a box, decorated with the Vajrayana symbols. The five-lobed crown of the five Buddha families was placed on his head, and a dorje and drilbu were placed in his hands, crossed at his heart. Rinpoche's kudung was placed on his throne in the shrine room. The funeral ceremonies then commenced and will continue for 49 days. The Dorsem rites were led by Tuku Tsepag Rinpoche and Gyalse Tuku Rinpoche with the assistance of Rinpoche's closest students. A group of Lama Dawa Chudak students were there and he was represented by his Western consort Kunzang Dechen Chudran. We had some nice talks and I liked it that two Gurkha Changlo Sanghas could talk in such an easy, friendly way. Gyalse Rinpoche was very nice and joined us for meals, where we all sat on the ground on cushions together. He made me feel very welcome and had a completely easy and relaxed presence. I remembered when Kunzang Dorje Rinpoche introduced you both to Lama Dawa Chudak and gave you both alcohol curd to drink, saying how he wanted you to keep in touch with each other. That was so nice. On Monday the 13th of September, as decided by Kyabje Trulshik Rinpoche, the Kudung Zhugbul took place. An open-topped cremation churton had been built on the roof of Rinpoche and Joma Sampel's apartment by Lama Damtsig Dorje, and it was he who led the cremation rites. The cremation services were presided over by Tsepak Rinpoche and Gyalse Rinpoche, and their retinue of lamas and students. Until this time it had been continuously raining in Kathmandu, but when the Kudung Zhugbo cremation began, the sky cleared completely. There were many amazing signs, like Tashidare cloud formations, rainbow clouds and all kinds of other sky phenomena. There was very little smoke from the Kudung Zhugbo and the cremation was completed very quickly. 
Jomo Sampa was entirely dressed in white, white shamtab and zen, with a white waistcoat just like Rinpoche used to wear. It was amazing to see her in this costume, as I have never seen her dressed like this in public. It really looked to me like she was the Vajra master there and presided over everything. Everyone deferred to her, which was really how it should be. Joma Sampal asked about you and about Dudaldorje and Kunzang Tsudran. I told her what you wrote and she said that it made her very happy indeed to hear the news. <coughs> she told me how much Rinpoche had loved you. Then she took my hand and I had to help her up. It seemed she wanted to take me up to the roof. Some people wanted to help her up the stairs, but she declined assistance as I think that she wanted to be private with me at Rinpoche's cremation churton. She held my hand and walked three times around it with many breaks where she looked into the sky. It was a beautiful sky and she pointed things out, so the three rounds took a long time. We both felt the churton, which was still hot. Then she made it clear that I could stay for a while. So I sat there and sang Flight of the Vulture for a while. The clouds started moving in extremely fast and dark. I sat a little longer, then went down to rejoin the others. Jomo Sampo gestured for me to sit next to her. I said out of the blue, I want to offer whiskey every day. Jomo Sampo really liked that idea. So now I have every day an hour of private time where I offer whiskey and sing Flight of the Vulture. Sepak Rinpoche and Gyalse Rinpoche said that there was no need to wait until the last week of the 49 days before the cremation churton was opened. It was opened a week after the cremation due to the fact that Rinpoche was an enlightened being. They said that the 49 days of Bardo Tudral practice was simply for the benefit of students. Rinpoche did not require it. I wished that I could have been there, so Barcher's daily letters were a great re resource for Kandradachan and myself. I printed them out every day so that we could read the letter together each evening. I'm going to a funeral dressed in white. I'm going to a nightclub to sleep with the night. And I'm not going with you. Why the words of this song came up for me is easier to tell than why I decided to quote it. The allusions are obvious with regard to Jomo Sampo wearing white. But what's not so obvious is the fact that I seem to see resonances everywhere. I've never divided my life as an artist or blues musician from my life as a practitioner or lama. I see resonances in so many things. The song concerns feelings of sadness and these abound in plenty at this time of writing. The sadness is not always present but swells in waves. When we received the news that Rinpoche had passed away, I was unable to speak or move for some time. I shan't dwell on this as it would be meaningless to anyone who doesn't know me. Rinpoche was 81 years old and so his passing was not unexpected. One would always wish for another final meeting, but the only cure for that wish is immortality for the person who has gone on to another life. When I was reunited with Rinpoche in the autumn of 1995, he encouraged me to speak about our relationship. He also urged me to write about our time together in a way that people would understand. He said that I should write it as a story, so this is what I've done. He encouraged me to recount the style of teaching he gave me and to use it for the benefit of the Gurkha Changlo Day in the West. 
Having lifted the injunction of secrecy that he placed upon me in 1981, I was free in 1995 to tell these stories as they were told to me in Sorpema, with all their extraordinary twists and turns. I began to commit the stories to writing in 1995, but it proved difficult. I was not a story writer and I was not satisfied that I could do justice to the task. I was a Buddhist textbook writer and a Western poet, but neither style worked in terms of breathing life into my account. I shelved the idea for more than a decade. I had to wait till I'd written my art school memoirs before I had sufficient experience of writing dialogue. I found the experience of writing narrative and dialogue for my art school memoirs ideal in terms of presenting Rinpoche's yogic tales. He didn't tell these stories to entertain or even to educate me, but to facilitate experiential understanding. These stories functioned as methods of transmission and the profound shock of each one has in no way diminished with the passing of years. The unfoldment of teaching tales is a vital ingredient of all religious traditions, so these stories have the necessary power to touch a wide range of people. Although a variety of these accounts will alienate a variety of people for a variety of reasons, they'll also communicate in various ways that cannot be predicted. This is the end of my story and the end of a 35-year relationship and its conclusion leaves me with tears in my eyes. <laughs>